thank you, Bass and Barbara and, and the whole team at AIR for inviting me into this important Rotterdam conversation about making a great city. You know, even though we can't be together, and so therefore I'm missing my opportunity to be in Rotterdam, which I always love, at least I can say hello out there to all of my long-term Rotterdammer friends. You know, Rotterdam and I have a long and special relationship. I live halfway around the world in Vancouver, but Rotterdam has often been my preferred destination over the last few years. I was Ayer's guest urban critic in 2009. Shortly after that, I joined the International Advisory Board through Rotterdam Partners with many meetings and visits after that. Uh, but I also have a kind of a natural affinity because Rotterdam and Vancouver are very similar places. We're port cities sitting in progressive countries. We're smaller cities that are doing quite big things which gives us, I think, a great opportunity to share experience. My experience in Rotterdam through the years has been taken back to Vancouver, and I hope the opposite has also been important. And it's on this basis that I really wanna make my contribution to the City Makers Conference today. So let's pull up that PowerPoint and look at our program that I put together for today. I call this presentation, Keeping Faith with Rotterdam's urban dream. So over the next 30 minutes, I wanna give you my take on the evolution that I have been seeing in Rotterdam, looking back a decade since my first visit. And then the outstanding issues that I see now on the horizon, including from COVID and some of the other big disruptors that are out there, looking a decade forward, say to 2030. And to do this, I wanna start by reminding you of that widely accepted urban framework that really underpins all of our work. I call it the dream. And with my talk, as you're already starting to see, I'll be using a lot of images from very different places to emphasize my, my many points. You know, photographing cities is a hobby of mine. So I hope that you will enjoy this as a kind of fun photo essay to go with my, my themes. So let's get started by remembering that urban dream that we all share. As you all know, it's a very different way of building cities than in the past, expressed really in two very profound themes that contrast sharply with the efficiencies that drove everything uh, with cities for the last century or so. The first, of course, is livability, creating a comfortable, interesting, and exciting city that meets needs, but also engenders loyalty and affection and great experience. This is the design side that draws people to want to be in the city, to invest in the city, and make their lives in the city. This is the human-centric city that is conceived from a consumer perspective rather than just for the needs of government or industry. The second theme, of course, is sustainability, creating a city that sits harmoniously within its setting, knitting into the natural and social and economic ecologies, cutting pollution, and weaning ourselves from the carbon addiction. This is the nature-centric city that really prepares us all for survival in the future. And these themes have really come together over the last 30 years into what I call the smart growth formula, offering a very common lens that we can all look through in our work. And here is that formula. This is about both the urban structure and the urban infrastructure of the city. From a structural point of view, it's about the form of our communities, clustered density and mixed use and all kinds of diversity within a neighborhood module that supports people, that brings people together with these growth modules sitting within a context of protected and delightful open space. It's about the fabric of our communities, green construction, 
And more and more, it's about placemaking, finding the right scale for your community, and then creating the lovely places that people remember and, and really want in their lives. From an infrastructure point of view, it's about the circulation within our communities, transportation choices, more than just the private car to transit and cycling and walking. And then of course, adding in all the new mobilities. It's about all kinds of supportive community facilities that offer culture and entertainment and social expression and really bring stability to our communities. And more than ever before, it's also about environmentally neutral utilities for energy, for waste, for water, and locally accessing inputs, especially for food and construction. Now, I myself have written about all of this in several books. Uh, in Eco Design, my co author, Jonathan Barnett, and I offer really hundreds of very specific creative examples of how smart growth is being applied all over the world. And then in Vancouverism, I dive quite deep into how one city, my city, uh, as part of a vanguard, has tried to put smart growth in place with all the advances and frankly, with the setbacks that make the story very real. It's a guide for smart growth, but it's also a bit of a warning of what to look out for. So I hope that these will be useful references to go deeper into the issues that obviously I can only surf over in the time we have today. Now, more recently, with the pandemic in full play, another theme has really shot to the forefront. And this theme, of course, is resilience, addressing survival against the unexpected, but also planning to cope with the challenges that you can expect and finding opportunity in adversity. This is the strategic city, deliberately prepared for many different contingencies. And we're all just struggling to understand the demands that resilience will bring to our communities. But let me say in no uncertain terms that COVID has really not fundamentally changed our urban dream. Even though it has added certain urgencies that we didn't think about before and shifted some of our current priorities. A really big message is to stay committed to the dream and all of the work that's necessary to transform Rotterdam the way that you know it needs to be transformed. Don't let the COVID distortions uh, confuse you or sidetrack you. I would dare say that the pandemic experience has emphasized for me that our kind of city offers just as many answers for resilience as it does for livability and sustainability. So that's the frame. Now let's turn to Rotterdam itself and the amazing changes over the last decade. I can't help but call this the Rotterdam achievement because this much change in this short a time in the right direction coordinated with the whole community is nothing short really of astonishing. I particularly want to celebrate what I see as four major advances over the last decade. First, your urban housing strategy is now very visibly reshaping Rotterdam to work better for everyone, including the government and all the citizens. You're making great headway in repopulating your core city with that target of 60,000 residents, which I can tell you is well within your grasp. This is simply destined to succeed, even though it will take probably more time than people have the tolerance for. Worry not. Our Vancouver experience shows that with all the many other measures that you're doing at the same time, build it and they will come. You also have a number of intense new neighborhoods coming together that are taking that quality urban experience out from the core, south across the river, and then also along the key rail lines in an organized way. Your strategy is certainly widening out the 
geography or for urban living, spreading and clustering density to offset traffic congestion and better deliver services and retail and offering options for middle-class, middle-income living and new types of housing. Now I would urge you to round out these neighborhoods with everything that they need to work and differentiate them from one another in whatever way that you can, however you can. We now know that the completeness and compactness of these neighborhoods is the key to solving so many modern urban issues. So for this, I really commend to you that 15 minute neighborhood concept that's sweeping the world right now as a target, it's well worth the effort. Secondly, your strategy to enhance public space is truly embellishing the look and feel of Rotterdam. That city lounge program, in my opinion, is one of the best in the entire world. I reference it everywhere, I celebrate it everywhere that I go, and it is beautifully tied to your related moves of adding more park space. I noticed particularly this very recent move of the seven city projects that link the park spaces together, but also securing your waterfronts for public use and planting more and more trees. And this is one specific thing that I'm very pleased to see. As you'll recall, it was one of my big recommendations for immediate action back in 2009. There's no question that Rotterdam feels much more green and fresh and in touch with its water than it was just a few years ago. My only advice now is more, more, and more. One of the bold happenings of the pandemic in many cities is what we are now calling the repossession of streets for people use, banishing the car altogether. Sometimes cities are even doing this illegally. So I say don't be shy about trying these sort of uh, transformations of your streets in Rotterdam. Thirdly, your reclamation of the old port lands as you build your state-of-the-art new port is, in my opinion, absolutely phenomenal. I appreciate the creative side, such as that wonderful floating dairy farm, but mostly I like how the lands opened up are being used strategically to realize your full urban vision, cutting sprawl and making everything more accessible rather than just scooping up these new lands for whatever new thing, new facility might come along. And this is truly the right course, especially as land becomes more and more scarce and expensive. Fourthly, with every visit, I see more and more attention to supporting community-based economic and social initiatives. Way back in 2015, I could see how dispersed startup culture of localized innovation was really starting to infill jobs and social infrastructure into neighborhoods. And we know that such indigenous economic development leads to more prosperity, especially available to marginalized people, but also to a consolidation of strong nonprofit social and culture sectors, and frankly, overall neighborhood stability. Whatever you invest in all of this, I can tell you, will come back to the good 10 times over. So, Rotterdam should be properly proud of what it has achieved, but I have to tell you that is just the foundation for the adventure to be expected over the next decade up to 2030 and beyond. So let me round out my talk today by looking at what I call the continuing Rotterdam challenge. And this has to do with enhancing that current agenda, uh, new pandemic urgencies, and some further disruptive game changers that are definitely on the horizon. I've already urged you to carry on with the current initiatives where surely, as I've said, you're on a roll, but there are some new additions that will bring out the very best of all of these plans. First, I strongly recommend that you push your core living targets even higher 
than they currently are. I would say it's very reasonable to set a target even beyond the pre-war 90,000 population for at least, let's say 120,000 Rotterdammers or more living comfortably downtown by 2030. And related to this, Rotterdam will also find great advantages to reinforcing housing densification with new targets for, for social diversity. A big breakthrough for Vancouver was our dedication to a truly child-friendly, child-populated city. You know, not only are kids uh, uh, a very uh, a wonderful addition to the ambience uh, of a city, a very delightful thing to see every day, but since most workers come from households with children, you can't really get people to put home and workplace close together unless the housing they have suits all of their families. In Vancouver, we set a goal of 25% of multiple households to be suitable for families with children. And in fact, we have now surpassed uh, that goal significantly. Well, I think with your traditions, I think you can go even higher. What about 50% of all multiple housing suitable for families? I think that's well within your reach. And the same can be said for income mix. Like everywhere, I hear Rotterdam is starting to feel the pinch for middle income people, the middle income demographic, even with your unique nonprofit development tools. Security of tenure at various price points is a very urgent aspect of the kind of city that we're trying to build. I commend Rotterdam to start to put in place a fully secure middle-income housing sector for at least 40% of future housing. It's not no longer just about low-income housing, but middle-income housing and upper middle-income housing, et cetera. And this was a big blindness in my city. And now modest and middle-income people do feel vulnerable in Vancouver. And that message from my city is that you have to get ahead of this before it really starts to hurt. Now, it also strikes me that Rotterdam may have a very unique opportunity to find some solutions to the worldwide issues of social integration. I think you can bring together several vectors that are very important in Rotterdam and very evident. Your strong economic drive to create new neighborhoods, the shift to development south of the, south of the river, your wide cultural diversity in these new developing areas and your natural inclination for startup innovation. I think this could spark new socioeconomic models to support the disadvantaged, new arrivals, and those with special needs as well as the rest of the population. Uh, with especially the addition of government programs for education and training and uh, support for micro initiatives and neighborhood-based facilitation of all of this. It's, it's key to have a localized framework for action that partners the municipality, local community, and creative individuals. This is building the city for all from the ground up, from the grassroots. And lastly, like every other city on the planet, Rotterdam cannot forget the green agenda and the imperatives to become environmentally responsible. I worry that this might be taking a back seat to the hard urban issues that are now hitting us every day. But we all know that environmental reconciliation remains the single most fundamental key to our future survival. Now, I'm not spoke, focusing on the specifics of this today. This has been a high point for many cities, including Rotterdam over the last few years, and you certainly know what needs to be done. But we just all have to stay the course for environmental reform. So now let's move to COVID. I've identified at least 10 trends from COVID that will obviously need action very, very soon. And it's interesting, if you look at this list, you'll see that there is as many opportunities 
as there are challenges in these new trends. Now I see Rotterdam as pretty camera ready to respond to many of these trends. Your city lounge can deliver more open space to deal and cope with uh, social separation. Your advanced transit and uh, mobility, active mobility system will really exploit that new demand for clean air that people have been feeling over the last year or so. And in both of these cases, I see expansion potential coupled with very deliberate action right now as an emergency to deal with some of the barriers that have been evident over just the last few months. I also think your social safety net will help you to handle the social and the psychological glitches of COVID as compared to most other cities. So this leaves really the conundrum of the explosion of digital life as the biggest set of questions for Rotterdam coming out of COVID as it is for many other cities. Something fundamentally new happened with the rapid and pervasive mechanical gear up of the home base in the technology network over the last just seven to nine months. Now the pros and cons of remote work and e-commerce uh, can no longer be avoided. They have to come to the top of the civic agenda. The potential for digital community organization and action have to be thought about. Mitigation measures have to be put in place very quickly to support local retail, or a lot of retail is going to go away very quickly, face-to-face -face retail. It also has to be mitigation measures to offer neighborhood infrastructure for uh, homework. Otherwise, those home workers are gonna feel very, very isolated. And then it has to facilitate social networks to apply to all kinds of issues of bringing people together in new ways and using that network potential to really boost the culture sector, which has been hurt so bad uh, by COVID. And you know, we're all just starting to tackle the uh, many answers that are needed here, but I wanna emphasize that this is an urgent challenge that really has to be dealt with before things really start to go sideways. And to a leadership audience, as you are, I also have to leave you with another thought. There, there is a lot of confusion out there about COVID among average people, uh, whether or not city life actually remains viable. Uh, does high rise living still work? Uh, is public transport uh, still uh, something that people want to use? Can cultural expression survive. People need positive assurances. So this is the time to speak out, to interpret, and to calm fears. In my country, to these ends, we have recently published a nationwide Canadian urban declaration to really help people separate fact from fiction in terms of their COVID experience. So now this brings us to the game changers. These are the hot new ideas that are being exposed by the most gutsy cities in the world. Now I've touched on a number of these, uh, but let me ginger your thinking with the two really big ones that I think are gonna be absolutely transformative. First, we have the emerging share culture. Now, this is not just about Uber and Airbnb. In the Nordic countries, this is now about shared housing, shared workspace, and even in Helsinki, a community-based localized currency app uh, for sharing of home appliances and trading of personal services, completely off of the financial and tax grid with really great household economies. And I think Rotterdam is in a great position to really uh, pursue the shared housing, for example, partly because of that multi-generational co-living tradition that really comes with many of the cultures have, who have decided to settle uh, in your city. Question is, do your laws accommodate this? 
Are your buildings suitable for this? This you have to really think about. I've also seen some very innovative co-workspaces, different kinds of projects in Rotterdam that give me great expectations, not only for that, but for many of the other fronts of sharing. So you have to take this much further. This has to become a priority agenda for new creative thinking as you go forward. Second, the world is absolutely being swamped by new forms of mobility and integrated mobility. Now, autonomous vehicles, of course, will have to be accommodated, but we're now seeing a crowd of really cool new personal mobility devices and one-pay systems for multi-mode travel that are often called mass mobility as a service. And everywhere, cities are trying to catch up with these transformative technologies. Of course, Rotterdam has a head start because of your long tradition of cycling and transit, but where are you gonna take it from here? I can say for sure that you will need tight controls and management of self-driving with new laws, new protocols, and new protections. No doubt that one payer concept, those one payer options will give real possibilities to transform the travel experience in Rotterdam. Question is, will those new mobility devices enhance public space or will they be disruptive? I think you have to very explicitly decide this as a government and as a community. So have you really started to think about these game changers in all of your plans moving forward in Rotterdam? And you know, in all of this ongoing work, there is a tendency to get frustrated at times uh, because reshaping the city and urban culture, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes staying power. You know, we ponder shortcuts. Uh, we, we think of holding off because of a lack of resources. Uh, we think maybe we should not do something because of the level of uh, public uh, agreement to do that. And we just have to banish these ideas from our thinking. And what helps me uh, is a reminder of an overarching urban ethic for our action that always seems to work, that always seems to really allow me and facilitate me to move things forward. So let me leave you with this ethic as my closing note. In a nutshell, it includes the imperatives of public engagement, building partnerships, insisting on explicit design, tapping those latest technologies, definitely shaping everything through a lens of equity and never sacrificing your identity for any other motive. And this ethic really needs to touch everything that a thoughtful city tries to accomplish. Maybe that uh, ethic of identity is the ideal way for me to close this presentation. If there is one thing that has been profound in the growth of Rotterdam's urban consciousness, it is the building of a city identity that really positively differentiates Rotterdam from all other places around it. I've seen through the years that you always search for a locally grounded approach in everything that you do. As I see it, you have key advantages which really engender this. You are contemporary, so you're not dependent on the historic image. You are young, so you're not laden by outdated traditions. You are affordable, so the creatives are especially drawn to you. You are innovative, so you're inclined to host the counterintuitive ideas and the upstarts where we all know the new solutions will be found. You are diverse. Your wide multiculturalism can translate much more profoundly that an idea that black lives matter into a genuine equation of social harmony. And you are European. So you enjoy a framework of law, and stability and a social safety net that really gives you the freedom, indeed the courage to take risks and actually make 
the transformations that will give you uh, a fulfilling city. And these special advantages form the essential backbone of what you yourselves call the Rotterdam Way. And I have no doubt that Rotterdam in 2030, with all of your unique style, will be a very special place. And that's the way it should be. So thank you all for listening. I understand we're gonna move just in a moment to a more interactive question and answer and discussion. I really look forward to that. Thank you, thank you very much.